God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter and welcome to Harvest Time Church. We're so glad that you've come to worship the Lord with us today. On this Easter Sunday morning, I want to talk about a resurrection encounter. Paul wrote to the believers at Corinth, what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles. And then he appeared to me also. It happened two or three years after Jesus arose on the first Easter Sunday morning. A Jewish Pharisee named Saul had an encounter with the risen Christ that rocked his whole world. You can find the story in Acts chapter 9. But I want to talk first about the story of Lieutenant Hero Onada. Did you hear about his surrender? Thirty years after the end of World War II he finally laid down his arms. Lieutenant Onada was 23 years old when the Japanese army sent him to the Philippine island of Lubang in 1944. He was in charge of a surveillance unit of four men. Their orders were to observe the enemy's activity on the island, gather intelligence, and wait for a Japanese invasion. The commanding officer charged him. You are absolutely forbidden to die by your own hand. It may take three years, it may take five, but whatever happens, we will come back for you. Until then, so long as you have just one soldier, you are to lead him. You may have to live on coconuts. If that's the case, live on coconuts. But under no circumstances are you to give up voluntarily. In October of 1945, Lieutenant Onada found the first leaflet saying that the war was over. He decided that it was an ally trick, so he retreated with his men deeper into the jungle. In December of 1945, an ally B-52 flew over the island dropping leaflets with an order to surrender from Japanese General Yamashita. Again, Lieutenant Onada decided that it was a trick. He and his men moved around the jungle, huddling in caves, eating coconuts and bananas. Occasionally, they would raid a farm at night and steal food, kill animals. They were suspicious that the villagers were ally spies, so they stayed hidden from them. Patrols went out into the jungles looking for Lieutenant Onada and his men. They shouted in Japanese through bullhorns. They left copies of Japanese newspapers and notes in the jungle saying, The war is over. Come down from the mountains. Again and again, Lieutenant Onada decided it was enemy tricks. One of his men suspected for some time that the war really was over, so he managed to escape from the group and made his way out of the jungle in 1949, five years after the war was over. When the families of the other three men learned that they were still alive, they sent photos, they wrote personal letters pleading them to uh, surrender, but Lieutenant Onada refused to believe. In 1954, 10 years after the war was over, one of his men received a leg wound and died. For the next 20 years, Lieutenant Onada and one subordinate hid in the jungles of Lubang. From time to time, they had run-ins with villagers and with patrols. Over the years, they killed 30 Filipinos and they wounded 100 others. In 1972, the last man under Lieutenant Onada was killed by a Filipino patrol 28 years after the war was over. Now he was all alone. In 1974, a Japanese college dropout told his friends that he was going abroad to search for a giant panda, the abominable snowman, and Lieutenant Onada. He flew to Lubang, and after just four days of searching, he found Lieutenant Onada. He explained to him that the war was over, but Lieutenant Onada refused to believe it unless he heard it directly from his commanding officer. The flunky went back to Japan, and remarkably, he found the commanding officer who was now a bookstore owner. 
they flew to Lubang together, and on March 9th, 1974, Lieutenant Hiro Onoda finally laid down his arms 30 years after the war was over. In his book, My 30-Year War, he writes, I said to him, really? We lost the war? How could they have been so sloppy? Suddenly, everything went black. A storm raged inside of me. I felt like a fool. What had I been doing all these years? Gradually, the storm subsided, and for the first time, I really understood my 30 years as a guerrilla fighter for the Japanese army were finished. This was the end. I pulled back the bolt on my rifle and unloaded the bullets. Had the war really ended 30 years ago, what had I fought for? That's a picture of his surrender. That's the crazy college flunky on one side. That's the commanding officer on the other side. He kept his rifle polished in the jungle for 30 years. Look at the commanding officer. He's looking at it like, I don't believe this guy. <laughs> Saul was waging a personal war of his own. He concluded that the followers of Jesus were incompatible with Judaism. He regarded the Jesus movement as blasphemous as a serious threat to the Jewish faith. It might hinder the coming of the Messiah, so he determined to stomp out this Jesus once and for all. It wasn't enough for Saul that large numbers of Jesus' followers had already left Jerusalem. He began to hunt them down in other cities. On the road to Damascus at midday, Saul and his party were knocked to the ground by a blinding flash of light. The risen Christ appeared to Saul, and right there occurred one of the greatest surrenders in human history. The world's greatest persecutor of Jesus Christ became the world's greatest preacher of Jesus Christ. What does it really mean to be a Christ follower? Saul's surrender on the Damascus Road shows us. As I look at his encounter with the risen Christ, I see three conditions of surrender for becoming Christ followers. And I want to share them with you on this Easter Sunday. What does it mean to be a Christ follower? Three conditions of surrender. The first one is this. Becoming a Christ follower means surrendering to Jesus as Lord. What does Saul's encounter show me? First, it shows me that becoming a Christ follower is not my decision, but an unconditional surrender to Jesus. You know, often we talk about salvation as if we were in complete control of the experience. We talk about accepting Jesus, receiving Jesus, inviting Jesus into our lives, as if we were a consumer choosing a product. Saul's encounter on the Damascus Road reminds us that God is the one in control of every salvation experience. It is not we who invite Jesus into our hearts. It is he who invites us into his kingdom. We don't choose him. He chooses us. We don't summon him when we're ready. He summons us when he's ready. You know, I love that old spiritual, I have decided to follow Jesus. It's one of the first songs I learned when I became a Christian in the early 70s. But maybe we need to rewrite it or add a new verse. He has decided that he will lead me. Saul's encounter reminds us that God is the initiator of our salvation. God took the initiative and sent his only son, Jesus, to show us what God is really like, to die on the cross for our sins, to rise again, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And God takes the initiative in every one of our hearts. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. That word for drawing means to pull against heavy resistance. It's the same word that was used when Jesus multiplied the fish in the net and the disciples pulled heavy against the, the net. They were pulling against the weight of it. In the same way, the Father is trying to draw us against our resistance, against our pride, against our doubts, against our fears. Growing up, I had lots of young friends in church who thought of salvation as a decision that was theirs to make. 
I'll accept Jesus when I'm ready. After I've had time to be young, have fun, drink Pepsi, then I'll get serious with God. You know when I'm old, like 30. <laughs> As if God has given any one of us the prerogative to accept him when and where and how we choose. No, true Christian conversion is unconditional surrender to Jesus when and where and how he chooses. Another thing I see, becoming a Christ follower is not to intellectually embrace doctrine, but it is to personally experience the Son of God. Beloved, can I tell you, you cannot be born into being a Christ follower. You could not marry into being a Christ follower. You can't study and pass an exam and be admitted to Christianity like you're being admitted to the bar. You can't even enter Christianity through a religious ritual. The only way to enter Christianity is to surrender into it during a real-life encounter with Jesus. Everything else, doctrine and rituals, it all comes after that. Many, many people are just like Saul. They know that Jesus was, but they don't know who Jesus is. There was no doubt in Saul's mind that a man named Jesus of Nazareth lived and died. Saul was a student in Jerusalem studying under Gamaliel when the Sanhedrin tried Jesus for blasphemy and handed him over to be executed. Saul knew that Jesus was, but he didn't know who Jesus is until he had a real life encounter with the risen Christ. Saul made two discoveries on the Damascus Road that we must make too. First, that Jesus is alive. Two or three years after the resurrection, Jesus showed Saul that he is alive. And 2,000 years later, on Easter Sunday, Jesus is still showing people that he is alive. <laughs> By overwhelming our hearts with his presence by healing our bodies, by speaking to us through human messengers, using the gifts of the Holy Spirit, by dreams and visions, by signs that point us to him. My prayer is this Easter Sunday that you could say it like Paul, and then he appeared to me. My prayer is that you'll have a revelation of Jesus so that you know in your innermost being he is alive. And not only is he alive, but he is large and in charge. His face shines brighter than the noonday sun. His voice roars like the churning sea. His presence knocks defiant men off of their feet and makes them tremble in despair of their very lives. Beloved, listen, Jesus is not the pale, defeated figure on a cross that some imagine him to be. He is not the mild-mannered, stoic philosopher of modern Protestantism. He is not the benevolent genie in a body that, bottle that some people call upon when they need a favor, he is the living one, the one who was dead but is now alive forever and ever, and he holds the keys of life. One flash of light from his glorious face is all it takes to stop you dead in your tracks and rearrange your whole life. Becoming a Christ follower is a sweet moment of surrender in the presence of God. It's a moment when you're captivated by him. His irresistible presence arrests you and you become convinced that he is alive and he is Lord. You know, that could happen anywhere, anytime. Could happen while you're worshiping at church. Could happen during a sermon. It could happen at an altar. It could happen in a quiet moment all by yourself. It could happen while you're talking with a Christian friend about Jesus. For one of my friends, his moment came on a long car ride to the Midwest. His wife was playing sermons on cassettes, and he wasn't a believer, but he was patiently listening as the miles rolled by. And somewhere between New York City and Oklahoma City, Jesus quietly arrested his heart. And when they arrived at their destination and got out of the car, he said to his wife, I believe. We might never have an experience of physically seeing a light that shines brighter than the sun, but Paul later wrote that the significant thing about that moment was that the light of God shone in his heart. 
He said, God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in my heart to give me the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That moment came for me when I was eight years old, all alone in my bedroom. Actually, it was right after the very first service I ever attended at a spirit-filled church. I wanted what I felt in that service. I wanted to have what I saw those people had. There was lots I didn't understand. Can I tell you the truth? 39 years later, there's still lots that I don't understand. I just knew I believed. And I prayed what was probably the simplest salvation prayer ever. I simply said, Jesus, I want everything you have for me. That was it. Can't tell you that a light shone from heaven. I can't tell you that my bed shook. I, I can't tell you that I had tingles or goosebumps, but I can tell you that I knew the beautiful presence of God came into my heart. The peace of God came into my heart, and it has never left me since. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious! Did that grace appear the hour I first believed? What does it mean to become a Christ follower? Three conditions of surrender. Surrender to Jesus as Lord. Second, becoming a Christ follower means surrendering your old way of life. Surrendering your old way of life. What does Saul's encounter show me? It shows me that surrender means a radical reordering of my life. Some people approach Christianity with the idea that they can just add Jesus into their life. They intend to keep on living the same way as always, but now with the added comfort of knowing that JC is in their corner. Early missionaries to India were delighted when they found that people were eager to receive Jesus as their God. The Hindus worshipped millions of gods and goddesses. They were happy to add one more but the enthusiasm dwindled in a hurry when the missionaries explained that receiving Jesus meant giving up all other gods. Now that was another matter altogether. But so many times our notion of Christianity is like that. We try to add Jesus to life as we know it, like we're adding a Facebook friend. But that's not at all authentic Christianity. True Christianity isn't just one compartment of your life. It is the organizing principle of your entire life. Surrender means admitting that my old way of life was insulting to God. Saul was in for the shock of his life. Jesus knocked him off of his high horse and said, Saul, Saul, why are you hurting me? Saul thought he was defending God. He didn't realize that he was offending God. And then Jesus said to Saul, aren't you tired of kicking against the goads? Goads are sharp sticks that are used to prod cattle. Saul didn't realize it, but his entire life he was resisting the Holy Spirit's, gu Spirit's guidance. By refusing to surrender to Jesus, his whole life had been bucking against God's leadership. Later on, Paul thought about his life before Christ. He said, I thought I was a good person. I thought I was sincere. I thought I was doing what was right. I, I was doing my best. I was trying my hardest. You know, we were once like Saul, unaware that our whole way of life was offensive to God and defiant to his leadership. We pursued our own goals. We chased our own dreams. We sought our own happiness and satisfaction, completely unaware that we were ignoring God and even sinning against him. Just like Saul, we don't see our fallen nature very clearly. Saul thought he was a good person. Meanwhile, Acts 9 said he had killer breath. It says that he was breathing out murderous threats. How many people do you know who regard themselves to be good people and yet they have killer breath? Their speech is full of anger and cursing and prejudice and malice towards others, even death wishes. Jesus said out of the contents of the heart, the mouth speaks. Like Lieutenant Onada, Saul faced a horrible moment when he realized all those years he had been so wrong. And beloved, surrender means the same thing for us. It's a humbling moment when we admit we have been wrong. 
all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon tells the story of an English prince who boarded a ferry one day. Beneath the deck was a rowing galley where prisoners were serving their sentence, pulling at the oars. The prince went down below and began to ask the men, What are you here for? What was your crime? One man after another declared his innocence to the prince. One said he was framed. Another said that false witnesses were brought in to testify against him. Another said the judge was bribed. Finally, the prince stood over one man and he said, And what about you, sir? Without looking up, the prisoner said, I am serving out the just reward for my sins. Immediately, the prince called the captain. Quick, he said, remove this malefactor at once from the presence of these upstanding men. It is not right that they should be made to bear his company. And the prince escorted the penitent prisoner off the ferry, a free man. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us. Surrender means trading my old identity for a new one. When the light from heaven disappeared, Saul's traveling companions helped him back to his feet. He was blind and they took him to the city of Damascus. He spent three days in the dark praying and fasting, fasting for repentance and purification, fasting for God's direction. During those three days of darkness, Saul identified with the death of Jesus, three days in the tomb. And his whole identity was stripped away from him. He emerged a new man. In fact, he even changed his name. Saul means ambitious, but he changed his name to Paul, which means small. He wrote about it later. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. For whatever things were valuable to me, I now count as loss. The things I liked about myself, the things I took pride in, the things that made me feel significant, now I count as rubbish that I might gain Christ. Surrender is no less for us. It involves a stripping process. The things we once took pride in, the things that made us feel significant, valuable, important, we surrender at the feet of Jesus. Surrender is trading your old goals for a new one. Saul had an uncommon ability to focus on his goals. If Saul had lived in the 20th century, he surely would have been an Edison or a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs. If he had been a politician, he would have been president. If he had been a businessman, he would have been Warren Buffett. No one in Israel traveled at high noon. It was way too hot. People traveled in the morning. They traveled in the late afternoon. But only Saul was so determined to go kill Christians in Damascus that he was out there like a fool at noontime. But when he emerged from three days in the dark, his old goals were all forgotten, and he was focused on just one new goal, to become an imitator of Jesus. Saul would have made a good New Yorker. We have an uncommon drive to reach our goals. But as you think about your own life, what goals are you pursuing? What are you driving hard after in the midday sun? Is it buckets of money? Is it to give your family the best of everything? Is it to raise your kids to be picture-perfect, well-rounded, sophisticated citizens of this world? Is it to find true love? Is it to have the most fun? Is it to be famous? Or are you pursuing the goal of Christ-likeness? Are you focused on the goal of knowing him as much as any man could ever know him? Are you focused on the goal of becoming as much like him as anyone ever could? Jesus said, seek ye first the leadership of Christ and the likeness of Christ, and then God will give you everything you need. How many of you know that's a good deal right there? Surrender is trading your old speech and behavior for a new walk and talk. After three days in the dark, no one could believe what was coming out of Saul's mouth now. No one could believe the dramatic about face in his behavior. And beloved, when Jesus rocks your world, it causes you to do an about face too. As followers of Jesus, we're called to be different, radically different. 
We don't love what the world loves. We don't chase what the world chases. We don't think like they think, nor do like they do. We used to sing an old spiritual, there's been a great change since I've been born. There's been a great change since I've been born again. Surrender is trading your old relationships and associations for new ones. All of Saul's traveling companions saw the light, but only Saul saw Jesus. They all heard a sound, but only Saul discerned Jesus' voice. When it was over, they all stood there speechless. They didn't know what had happened, and they didn't know what to do with Saul. Beloved, when Jesus rocks your world, some of the people that you've been traveling with are not going to understand what just happened to you. They won't know what to do with you. Some people won't like the new you. They'll want the old you back again. Saul's boys turned on him and tried to kill him. His new family in Christ had to stuff him in a basket and lower him over the city wall of Damascus at night to save his life. When he got to Jerusalem, the believers had to whisk him to the seacoast and put him on a ship to save his life. Beloved, when you surrender to Jesus, it will cause ties to be severed with your old traveling companions unless they surrender too. The people who were like family to you yesterday won't feel like family anymore. And believers who were complete strangers and completely strange to you yesterday will feel like family right away. Becoming a Christ follower means the radical reordering of my life, surrendering my old way of life, my old identity, goals, behavior, relationships, and associations. What does it mean to become a Christ follower? Three conditions of surrender. Surrender to Jesus as Lord. Surrender your old life. And finally this, becoming a Christ follower means surrendering to Jesus' call. What does Saul's encounter show me? It shows me that salvation always comes with a call to service. On the Damascus road, Saul asked Jesus two questions. Who are you, Lord, and what must I do? Jesus told him, get up, go in the city, and I'll show you what you must do. Beloved, beloved Jesus' call to salvation always comes with a call to service as well. Jesus said, you didn't pick me, I picked you, and I ordained you to bear fruit. Your call means a surrendering to God's preparation process. Acts 9 summarizes a three-year period of Saul's life. During that time, Saul's preparation included time alone with God in the wilderness. It included time studying the Bible, fasting, and praying. Saul's preparation process included receiving care from the family of God and participating in the life of the church. Actually, Saul's preparation process involved a 13-year period of humbling experiences when it didn't appear that his life was going to amount to anything at all. If you're saved, you are called to serve. And that means surrendering to a preparation process that he has custom-tailored just for you. And at times it might not look like you're getting anywhere very fast, but your call comes with the promise that ultimately Jesus will make something beautiful out of your life. After Jesus himself, the apostle Paul became the second most influential person in human history. He became the author of one third of the New Testament. He took the gospel from Jerusalem all the way to the coast of England. For a guy who called himself small, he accomplished some great big things. All because one moment in the presence of Jesus, he said, I surrender. Later he wrote, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be opened so that you might know what is the hope of his calling. We have a little saying here at Harvest Time, your call is not your call. That means it's not your call whether you're called. You are called. It's not your call to what you've been called. It's his call. But there's a hope that comes with his call. Everything you need, all the provision you need, all the protection you need, all the courage you need, all the wisdom you need, all the creativity you need, all the strength you need, all the longevity you need, it is all in his call. Sadhu Sundar Singh 
is known in India as the apostle of bleeding feet. That's his picture. That is not Pastor Bobby in a turban. That's Sadhu Sundar Singh. At the dawn of the 20th century, he preached the gospel across northern India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Burma, Tibet, Malaysia, China. He was raised in a Sikh family, but his parents sent him to a Christian missionary school to learn English. At the age of 14, Sundar's mother passed away and he blamed the Christian God. He began to incite persecution against Christian missionaries and against Christian converts. He invited on one occasion his friends to come and watch while he stood in the center of town and he tore a Bible page by page and burned it page by page till he burned the entire Bible. He was so distraught over the loss of his mother that he finally resolved to kill himself by jumping in front of a train. On the night before he determined to go through with it, he had a vision of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, that radically transformed his life. He surrendered to Jesus. He announced to his father the next morning that he had become a follower of Jesus and his father disowned him. On his 16th birthday, he was baptized in water as a Christian convert and his family invited him to come for a birthday celebration where they proceeded to poison him because he had become a follower of Christ. Some people found him dying in the street and they carried him to the doorstep of the Christian missionary. As he lay on a sofa dying, a thought occurred to him. Jesus didn't save me out of this darkness, only to die without leading one single person to faith in Christ. I must live so I can tell someone about Jesus. On the basis of that thought alone, he began to earnestly pray with the last bit of strength left in him, God, don't let me die until I have led at least one person to Jesus. Don't let me die until I have led at least one person to Jesus. God heard his prayer and miraculously healed him, and he recovered from the poison. He put on the yellow robe of a Hindu holy man, and with no shoes on his feet, he began to walk across India telling people about Jesus. He was arrested, he was beaten, he was slashed, he was stoned on numerous occasions for preaching Christ. He was last seen at the age of 39, crossing back into Tibet to preach the gospel, where it's believed that he was martyred and thrown into a river. But he's credited with performing hundreds of miracles in Jesus' name, leading tens of thousands of people to faith in Christ and laying the foundation for the 20th century church in five countries. All because when he became a Christian, he also realized what is the hope of his calling. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be opened on this Easter Sunday morning, that you would realize what is the hope of his calling. Surrendering to Jesus isn't always easy, but it comes with the promise that he will make something beautiful, something meaningful out of your life. Your life will count for something. Your life will make a difference. Your life will be blessed to be a blessing. You will make a contribution that is valuable on earth and in heaven simply because you said, like Saul to Jesus, I surrender. We've gathered on this Easter to worship the risen Christ. But what does it really mean to be a Christ follower? It means to have your own personal encounter. When you say, like Saul, to Jesus, I surrender. I surrender to Jesus as Lord. I surrender my old way of life. I surrender to Jesus' call. Yes, I surrender all. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus Christ, the risen King, the risen Savior, a great big praise in this place.